We are ready to get started for our Women at SciTech panel and networking event. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled to be here today with each of you. Uh, thank you for all of those in the room and thank you to everyone online as well. Uh, I am Melissa Sampson with Ball Aerospace. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and I have to say, this is one of my favorite events, uh, probably because I get to moderate and I get to sit on stage and hear from each of these wonderful speakers. Uh, we've been talking a lot about sustainability this week and what that looks like in different venues, topics, themes, and challenges. And we're excited this evening to talk more about navigating a, a sustainable career, which we'll talk more about. Now that I, I have introduced myself, I'd like to briefly introduce each of our speakers this evening. First up, we have Audrey Powers, Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations at Blue Origin. She is responsible for all New Shepard flight operations, vehicle maintenance, and launch, landing, and ground support infrastructure. She's also been Vice President of Legal and Compliance at Blue Origin and has worked at NASA and Lockheed Martin. She received a bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue University. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Claudine Fair. She is a principal systems engineer at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. She has previously worked at General Motors, Raytheon, and other areas of Lockheed Martin. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in aerospace and mechanical engineering from the State University of New York at Buffalo. She also has a certificate in airframe and power plant from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and a master's degree in business administration from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Welcome, Claudine. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Bree Fram. She is the president of Sparta and on active duty with the US Space Force. Sparta advocate excuse me, advocates and educates about transgender military service and is dedicated to the support and professional development of over 1,300 transgender service members. A member of SPARTA since 2014, she focuses on policy and advocacy work to develop a more inclusive military. She's held a variety of positions within the U.S. Air Force as well. Welcome, Bree. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's give our panelists a quick round of applause to welcome them. All right. So now that I've given a brief introduction with the bios, um, I would like to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves in their own words, uh, tell us a little bit about their career and their journey, and share more of themselves with our audience this evening. Audrey, if you'd like to start. Thanks, Melissa, um, and thank you for the invitation for having me. Uh, I, as Melissa indicated, have had kind of a circuitous um, career path. I began as an engineer in uh, operations, in human spaceflight operations for NASA on this, the International Space Station program, and that really was, um, I, I have the sincere great luck of my first job out of college um, being an absolute dream, working in human spaceflight operations at NASA at a time that the space station program was really just starting. There was one, um, there was one element on orbit. I was there for the launch of our first crew, and now obviously we've had a human presence on that facility for um, 20 plus years. So uh, from, from there, kind of how do you, how do you top that? Uh, I, um, I decided to go to law school after being an engineer for about 10 years and really wanted to stay involved in the space industry. Uh, I, was, I was very, very fortunate um, to have some wonderful mentors early in my um, post-law school career, and I found my way to, to Blue Origin when it was quite small. Um, there were about 250 um, employees at Blue when I, when I joined uh, over eight years ago. And I've watched um, and, and helped the company grow into a you know 4,000 plus uh, employee um, multi uh, multi uh, location uh, company. So 
Um, I, I found my way very recently um, in the middle of last year back to um, now leading the, the mission and flight operations team uh, for New Shepard. Uh, and so I just, I could not stay away from human space flight operations. That's kind of been my, my passion and what I, um, what has always really drawn me to keep working in this, in this industry. And I uh, had the unbelievable good fortune of um, flying on the vehicle for which I, I um, managed the flight operations team. I, I was an astronaut on um, NS-18 back in, back in October. So that is, I should... I should leave it there because that is the culmination for sure of my, <laughs> of my professional career. Fantastic. Uh, Claudine? So I'm originally from um, New York City, the Bronx. I um, went to school in Buffalo upstate, the only state school that offered aerospace engineering. Um, so from there, I got a job in the automotive industry, but I'm a starving aerospace engineer and I'll go where the job is, right? So. Um, quickly learned that the automotive industry is not where my passion was. So I made my way to Raytheon Missile Systems in Tucson, Arizona, um, and then said I wanted to work on aircraft after working on missiles. So I moved over to Wichita, Kansas, and um, worked there on a number of commercial business jets. Um, that was a really great experience for me. And then I had my daughter um, and no family support in Kansas. So I clicked my heels three times and said, I wish I was home and went over to Sikorsky Aircraft where I worked on a 53K heavy lift helicopter for 10 years. Um, so there I was able to sh come on shortly after the contract signing um, through flight tests or th through a portion of the flight test and once I got my MBA, I was able to work in some business development capacities. Now, I had always wanted to work for Skunk Works from, since I graduated college. Um, so um, there was an opportunity that opened up at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, and I moved across the country um, with my 12-year-old daughter, and we moved to Palmdale, um, where I've worked on hypersonic aircraft as well, hypersonics as well as supersonic aircraft. Great, great. So growing up, uh, my passion was dinosaurs, and I was sure I was gonna be uh, a paleontologist. But when I was about nine years old, a friend of mine dragged me nearly kicking and screaming to watch an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation with him. And my worldview changed on a dime, like, I wanna be Geordi. I wanna make the warp engines go. <laughs> Uh, and I am gonna figure out a way to, to make that happen. Um, and that was a nine for me. My oldest is now 13 and she still loves dinosaurs, so she's kept it a lot longer than I have with all her posters on the wall of nothing but dinosaurs. Uh, but so my, my desire to you know, do something in space, maybe be an astronaut someday, took me to study aerospace engineering at the University of Minnesota. And when I graduated in uh, the spring of, of 2001, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go interview, I'm going to, you know, get a job somewhere, and, and over the summer, that's, that's what I did. I interviewed with a number of, of uh, civilian companies, and it didn't seem like a great fit, but I was going to keep at it, uh, and that's when the attacks of September 11th happened. And again, talk about a worldview changing on a dime. Um, a week, well, actually, four days after those attacks, I was driving from the, the Twin Cities to see my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, uh, in Duluth, which is a two hour drive uh, that thankfully I could do on autopilot because when I saw a US flag hanging from the overpass, you know, something you'd never saw before but all of a sudden was everywhere, I broke down. I cried for like an hour straight uh, on the way to see her and when I walked in uh, to her apartment, I said, I'm gonna join the Air Force uh, because I wanted to give back I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself and help defend the freedoms that had given me so much. Uh, and that was a way to both do that and keep working in the space industry in something that I cared so much about. So I started an amazing career. It'll be 19 months in like, or 19 years in like three days for me uh, in the service. Uh, done a number of, of cool jobs. Started at the Air Force Research Laboratory, uh, working all sorts of small programs. Uh, launch vehicle vibration isolation, F-15 based launch vehicle, 
um, what ended up becoming the ESPA ring on, on EELV. Um, the Air Force decided to send me off to a, get a graduate degree in, in astronautics, uh, which was a great opportunity when you get the chance to go to school and have your full salary paid. You're like, absolutely, <laughs> uh, please do. And when we showed up there, the, the commanding general said, I expect all of you to succeed, not because you're highly motivated, very talented uh, young Air Force officers, but because you were the highest paid graduate class in the world, so you had better <laughs> succeed uh, at what you're doing here. Um, and then went on to work on the, the SIBRS program to do space-based infrared, uh, do missile warning, missile track, worked for the National Reconnaissance Office doing ground maintenance on all their uh, mission processing for signal intelligence satellites. Uh, and then I've done a mishmash of jobs since then. Uh, was lucky enough to be a defense fellow, worked on Capitol Hill for a year doing policy uh, in a congressional office, done plans and programs for the Air Force, Air Force International Affairs, uh, I was the country director, which meant I led all um, security cooperation with Iraq, uh, which was a, a real big detour for me. Um, I got sent back to the Air Force Research Laboratory as a commander uh, to work on counter UAS and offensive cyber, again a detour, but need to see how those intersect, especially with space capabilities. Um, and now after a year at the Naval War College for another master's degree, uh, I'm now at the Pentagon doing space acquisition policy for the Space Force. Uh, just this summer, I was able to recommission into the Space Force, swearing in, standing in front of the shuttle at the Udvar Hazy Museum uh, near Dulles, which was the coolest opportunity in my life, and now to be part of something new in the Space Force and help set what is a 21st century military, um, and we'll talk a lot about culture and, and how we create that inclusive culture. So just cool opportunities abound in my career, and so looking forward to this discussion and, and your questions. Thank you. Uh, first, coming back to our theme for this evening, uh, navigating a sustainable career. Uh, it's a very broad phrase intentionally, and it probably means something different to each of the people who are attending this talk tonight. Uh, Bree, I'd like to start with you. Could you tell us more about what that means to you? So, as you mentioned, there are so many ways this discussion could go in terms of a sustainable career. Um, and to me, a key though, and this is applicable to so many different things, is authenticity and being yourself, being able to bring your full self to work. Because for those of us uh, that may have had to at some point, you know, change the way we presented ourselves to the world based on the expectations of those external to ourselves, or to hide a part of our identities, we understand there's a cost that comes with that. When you have to dedicate your energy, and it truly takes energy to protect who you really are and present a different face to the world, to your company, to your friends, even to your family in some cases, that takes a toll on you as an individual. But when you are free to be your authentic self, when you are able to bring that to the workplace and to everywhere that you are, that energy is available to you to be dedicated to the mission of the organization, to your personal goals, to the things you want to accomplish. So when I think about a sustainable career, it's about how do I have the energy I need to get all the things done that I want to accomplish. And if I have to waste it on these ancillary things, that's a big problem. But again, if you can be who you are, if we can be in environments that support everyone for who they are, it truly unleashes us to reach our full potential. Uh, and that's really what a sustainable career is about for me, getting to that full potential and, and not having those barriers in your way. Absolutely. Uh, Claudine, would you like to speak next? So for me, you know, I think about going into the aerospace industry at the end of the Cold War era, and my professors tell me, don't do it, don't do it, there's no jobs. So I double majored in aerospace and mechanical engineering. And to ensure that I always had a job, I would always stay on top of the latest technologies that were happening. Um, so that way I would always be able to, you know, find a job in an event that I ever needed to find a job, which I never did. Um, but um, 
for me, sustainability initially, when I heard the term, I thought about, you know, going into the aerospace industry at a time where the Cold War era was um, ending and there was a decline in jobs. So how do you maintain your relevance? How do you maintain your, um, your need in the industry? Um, and to do that, I, you know, stayed ahead of the technologies, et cetera, and, and learned new technology. So um, for a sustainable career, I think that's one of the um, tools that I use. Um, also, when I think about sustainability, I think about um, maintaining or exceeding um, what your current level is. And I think about um, myself as an uh, underrepresented member of a, um, of a member of our underrepresented population. And I think about, you know, how are we opening the doors and increasing um, the number of underrepresented um, engineers in the field? Um, you know, why are we still sometimes going to meetings and we're the only ones that look like us? So for me now, I'm, you know, 20 plus years in my career, sustainability is about opening doors for everyone, right? Um, I want to leave this industry, I'm a Girl Scout, so, well, I'm a Girl Scout leader, and <laughs> was never a Girl Scout, but um, in Girl Scouts, we have a saying, we leave things better than we found it. So, to me, sustainability means leaving the industry better than uh, when I came in. Wonderful. Awesome. What are your thoughts, Audrey? Well, I... I hear a couple of themes here in, in uh, my fellow panelists' answers. The, it, sustainability for me um, definitely has to do with maintaining the things that are important to me in my career. So um, a, a staying in a, a challenging role, a role that challenges me, and um, a, working for a company and in a role that I feel very passionate about and where I have really strong connections to the team that I'm a part of and, and kind of those, those personal relationships that I think are required to succeed at something really important. Um, so that, that for me is what I want to maintain. Those are, the, those are the qualities of my career that I want to maintain um, in, in thinking about sustainability. And so I think once you've established that, what do, you, what do you want to be consistent through your career? What are the themes that you want to carry with you? Um, then it becomes the, the harder question of how do you do that? What decisions do you make about your career path? Um, how do you approach um, being successful in those areas? And as I've, as I've grown older, I think I've, um, I've, I've realized that it's, it's exceedingly important for me to maintain balance across the various diverse areas of my life. So if I am physically fit and mentally fit, and if my relationships with my family and friends um, are healthy and fulfilling, then I find that I can bring my best self to my career and that I, um, I show up with energy every day, to, to, to Bree's point, um, and I bring my best self as a teammate to the people that I'm working with. And I've, it's, it's interesting as you, as you, um, you know, meet colleagues and make connections. I, I have plenty of colleagues who thrive in exactly the opposite environment, right? When, when, when they're seeing a challenge in one aspect of their life, a personal relationship or something like that, um, they kind of can use work as an escape maybe and they really throw themselves into their, into their profession and, and find success that way. And, and I really see um, in, for me personally, that it's exactly the opposite, that if the other aspects of my life are not healthy and thriving, that I'm not bringing my best self to, um, to my career and, and helping to maintain all of those things that are important on that side of the house. Um, and this has really um, been very challenging to me. So we, we talk so much about work-life balance, but when you, when you really establish as a goal um, for yourself that, that these things need to be balanced. It's a very, it's a very challenging thing to do, I've, I've found. Um, so that was, uh, this was, this was a super interesting topic to think about. I, I, I appreciate the, the discussion. Absolutely. Can I add and, and jump on in violent agreement with, with Audrey? It's kind of that classic uh, announcement on the airplane. Put on your own oxygen mask first because right. if you're not taking care of yourself, 
event, say you're throwing yourself into that work problem to avoid family stuff or whatever else it is, at some point that's likely to blow up and get worse. Mm -hmm. So take care of yourself. Uh, we all know there are there going to be those times in our careers when, you know, for me, you know, a deployment or something where I am giving myself 24 hours a day to the mission, to the job. But when it's not that time, I take those opportunities to recharge, to connect with friends, family, do the things I love, you know, whether go climb a mountain, stand on top, look down and say, mm -hmm. recharge uh, and do those things to, to have that balance you need. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. Uh, I want to say also thank you to the audience for the questions. Uh, we do have the web link up above us for both everyone in the room and online. Um, so I'm definitely keeping an eye on those questions as well. Uh, so Brie, you've mentioned um, authentic selves and imposter syndrome, uh, which I know I've definitely experienced. Most of us probably have had some sort of experience at least once in our careers. Um, would some of our panelists like to talk more about that or share some experience about being authentic and or imposter syndrome? So I'll, I'll, I'll start if, as you, you mentioned me on that one. Yeah, I think imposter syndrome is probably something a lot of us face in, in one form or another to one degree or another. For me, it was that very first assignment in the Air Force where I, I show up no training, no experience, because for acquisition and engineer folks, we don't go to any training right off the bat. You're just thrown in the deep end, and I'm handed this portfolio of uh, small business innovative research and other contracts to run. And they're like, here's your four, $4.3 million portfolio. And I'm looking around like, who? You, <laughs> you want me to do this? This seems like way more money than I, at, at this age, should be responsible for. Uh, and to tr have to at that point just like, well, just figure it out. You know, they wouldn't be giving you this if people hadn't succeeded in the past or you weren't capable of succeeding. You haven't given that indication that it is there for you. So it's just an, you have to take those as this is an opportunity to succeed and to find the tools to ask the questions uh, to make that happen. Um, so I, when I get that feeling of, am I the right one, is this me? I try and turn it on, on its head and say, what an opportunity to go do something amazing. Great. Um, I, I have a very recent and kind of st striking example of this. Ba back in October, um, I, was, I was approached by a, a colleague at Blue, um, and, and luckily I was sitting a, alone in a, in a conference room late on a Friday when I got this phone call. Um, and he said, on, on behalf of Jeff Bezos and the senior leadership team of Blue, we'd like you to represent uh, Team Blue and fly on the next New Shepard flight. And um, my first thought was, oh, you've got this so wrong. You are, <laughs> you have made the wrong choice. I immediately thought of a, a, a few of my amazing colleagues who I was certain deserved that phone call way more than me. I immediately thought, but I haven't done this or I don't have that quality or, um, you know, the laundry list of things we come up with when faced with an opportunity and, and this, um, this, this imposter um, devil starts talking on our shoulder. And um, I was silent for probably an uncomfortably long period of time, and he was probably wondering what on earth. Um, and on the heels of that thought, like, this, they are calling the wrong person. They have, they have got this. <laughs> They've got this wrong. Um, I thought you know, the, the authentic self also spoke up and said, this is your life's dream, literally. This is your life's dream. There is no way, there is absolutely no way you can say no to this. And, and to be clear, I, I very much felt like he was asking, <laughs> you know, this, this is an offer, you can turn it down if you want. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I think, um, Having, having that speak up at the, at the same time was a very interesting and stark contrast uh, for me and not one in, in times that I've experienced imposter syndrome in the past, I did not also have that strong of a side of me saying, 
um, you know, you have wanted to do this since you started walking. Um, and there's absolutely no way that you can say no to this. And the, uh, you know, worry or conflict or uh, it's hard to even uh, put into words the, the feelings that I had at that moment um, were just, were, were so strong in, in both directions. And, and obviously I, I said yes, um, <laughs> but since, since then, um, I think you have two parts of two parts of imposter syndrome, right? It is, it is you personally telling yourself, "But I don't have these qualities. I don't have these capabilities. Everything, everything I am not um, that that makes this whole situation wrong and me not the right person for it." Um, and then the other side of it is this other person is the right choice, right? They should have chosen. Uh, that person over there for all of these qualities that they have. And um, since, since my flight, um, I have found myself feeling almost apologetic to, to people, to, to my amazing colleagues who I think deserve, um, deserve such an opportunity um, to fly to space on this unbelievable vehicle that we've, that we've created. Um, and I've, I've uh, really been struck by those kind of pangs of my natural response being, um, you know, almost almost guilt uh, that that I got this opportunity that I feel like someone else should have gotten. And um, so this is really the past few months have have been a a process of maybe developing in a way that I did not experience <laughs> that I did not expect um, at at the at the beginning of this and. Um, it's really, uh, I, I have shared with now, having shared this with a room of hundreds of people, I, I have shared this with just a few very close um, friends of mine that I, that I struggled in that way with, with this experience. And, and they, as I would have done for any of my friends, um, you know, immediately swung to all the, all the reasons uh, that that's, that's wrong and I shouldn't feel that way. And it's not comfortable hearing that either, right? Like, it, it makes me very uncomfortable for someone to say, oh no, but you, but you have this quality, and you have that quality, and you're successful in this way, or that way, or it. It's a very uncomfortable kind of reinforce, and they're only trying to help, right? They're only trying to make the imposter syndrome go away, but um, I find that almost an equally difficult thing to, to, to deal with as, as, um, as the base kind of imposter response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes, because I, for one, am fanning out here and having my own imposter um, syndrome. But, you know, I, for me, I had an amazing experience in my freshman year. I was taking a programming class and um, was struggling, like, you know, in a library all day, in a computer lab all day. And um, we go in and we take the test and my classmate, he, um, he's like, oh, that test was so cake, that test was cake. And for a minute there, I thought, am I really cut out for this? Because that test was not cake for me. <laughs> so um, it just so happened, I, the, I had the fortune of sitting behind him when we got the test back. <laughs> 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 and I love it. He got a, a C and I got a B. I love it. <laughs> and, and right there, it just, it just was like such a humbling lesson. Like it was something that was, des was like destiny because right then my freshman year in school, it just taught me never to compare yourself against anyone, right? I think we're, we are our best competitors, right? Let's try to focus on doing the best that we can because when you compare yourself to other people, you don't know what their story is. I mean, if I didn't sit behind him in that class, I would have probably spent the, you know, spent the rest of my academic career feeling, you know, like I shouldn't have belonged there, that I shouldn't belong there. But I had the fortune of seeing the truth and that carried me, you know, throughout my life is, you know, try not to compare yourself with others because you don't know their story. You don't know what their, 
I'm sure he probably, if I would have asked him what he got, I'm sure he wouldn't have told me. <laughs> so, you know, you always have to just be your own, you know, you compete against yourself. You don't have to compete against anybody else. Wonderful. I'm so excited with this discussion. Um, and thank you to each of you for sharing so much of yourselves, not only with me, but with our audience. Because um, sometimes these are hard to talk about. We're, we're, you're making yourselves vulnerable. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I would like to ask one more question as a moderator. Uh, and it ties in a little bit to some of the audience questions I'm seeing. So each of you have a very significant recent accomplishment on top of all of your other achievements and accomplishments. Uh, so I'd like to highlight this one recent accomplishment for each of you and um, offer the floor if you'd like to talk more about it. So Bree, I'd like to recognize your very first published book. Uh, it is With Honor and Integrity, Transgender Troops in Their Own Words. Um, I'm thrilled to have my very own copy now, so thank you. Um, Claudine, you were recently recognized as a Lockheed Martin Associate Fellow. Um, this is a very significant achievement and recognition. Uh, and Audrey, you're an astronaut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, each of these things is just incredible. Um, and I know that there's so much more coming with each of your careers. Uh, but with that, I'd like to open the floor to each of you to either expand on it or talk about how you were able to do this accomplishment or what motivated you to achieve it. Well, I, I can go down line. My passion for human space flight has, has followed me through my career. I, th I think um, I, I definitely, early on in, in my life and career, I thought um, I had this model of the professional astronaut, um, the, the, the NASA model that um, you know, so many of us grew up with. And I, I thought, you know, well, I'll, I'll apply one day and I'll probably apply some more and apply and apply and apply as we all <laughs> hear. That's, that's how it goes um, to sometimes uh, becoming a NASA astronaut. And um, at, at some point in my career, I'm not sure, it, it wasn't a, a conscious decision, like I can't point to the day that it happened, but I just um, accepted that I think it, it wasn't going to happen for, for me. Uh, I, was, I was very, very happy to um, help other people uh, go to space and, and have that exploration opportunity and um, and I was I was very satisfied in a in a career doing that. Um, so when this I, I I will say at 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 Blue Origin um, our our vision of increasing access to space um, for the for the benefit of our our home planet um, is is very much about um, creating autonomous reusable vehicles. So. We are, we are creating an industry in a future of space travel where you don't need the traditional professional astronaut model. Um, and particularly with New Shepard being a, a shorter suborbital experience, um, we don't need pilots or co-pilots on board. We don't need um, people from Blue Origin attending to the customers uh, on board. And so no one at Blue Origin has expectations that they will fly. We do not hire people for the purpose of flying on our vehicles and, and being astronauts. It just is not part of, it, it's not part of the architecture. Um, and so I, I, I will say I could not have been um, more surprised that this opportunity came my, my way. And uh, I, when I think about, when I, when I put all the imposter stuff aside that we were just talking about, when I think about how this good fortune um, landed on me, I think the, you know, first and foremost, uh, someone looked at me and said, she is a representative of this entire team, right? This company of 4,500 people, she, um, she exudes the qualities of, of that team blue. And when I think about how it is that I, that I develop those qualities or sharpen them or de you know, develop them, um, there's, a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot of being a great uh, teammate, uh, the, you know, experiences that I had in my life that helped me foster those qualities, everything from 
um, playing team sports when I was a, was a kid and having amazing coaches that taught me what it was to be relied on and to rely on, on other people. Um, being in team environments in, in college and in law school and understanding what it is to give and take. You know, I know I understand a concept really well, my friend understands another concept really well, and together, like, we are amazing. And um, having empathy for the people around you and the people on your team and, and uh, having some responsibility and accountability for the success of the people sitting next to you, right? I am responsible um, for Claudine and Bree's success. Um, I have a vested interest in whether they succeed because it makes the team better. Um, those are things that I feel very, very strongly ab about. Um, and so I, I think I've, I've been very lucky to have mentors and team leaders in my past that I could pick out those qualities from and say, I want to take this with me. That person is really, really great at X, and I, I want to follow. I, wa I want to incorporate that into my, into my career and my, and my life and, and be successful in that way. So um, to be an associate fellow, um, what I mentioned having, to, having moved around for the aer cool aerospace jobs, right? So that actually worked in my favor because I was able to see how you certify commercial aircraft. I was able to see how you certify military aircraft, how you um, certify um, NASA aircraft, et cetera. So um, for me, I'm, my two disciplines um, that I have my fellowship in is systems engineering and airworthiness. So having seen all of those different platforms and understanding you know, the different systems and how they all come together to meet this end goal was actually a strength that helped me uh, become an associate fellow. Um, I also had amazing mentors along the way um, at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. So um, we had, I had uh, three um, mentors um, who were tech fellows. Um, in order to be an associate fellow, you have to be mentored by a tech fellow, and I had three. Um, three amazing tech fellows. Two were women and one was a man. Um, all equally amazing. Um, and what it means to me, it's significant for me because now I'm able to leverage my experience to help Lockheed Martin exceed its goals in anything, right? Because I know how to decompose a system from the concept to when it's fielded to how we're going to support it, et cetera. So it's a way for me to kind of um, leverage my strengths to help the company succeed. So I think you heard two stories there that a lot of the focus was on, on leadership and not on leadership for me. Leadership for us, uh, leadership for the company, and leadership in a way that enables those who follow us to go further and to do more. Mm -hmm. uh, so in getting back to, you know, why did I write a book, you have to go back to, well, why did I come out as trans? Uh, why, on the day the ban was dropped uh, in 2016, did I come out? And, and I can go back and, and look at the letter that I shared with colleagues and sent to friends and family, and it talks a little bit about the why. And it has to do with, because I can help. If I do this now, and later when I transitioned while, while a commander, it was, how can I help? How can I make this better? and a little bit of the sense of responsibility of coming out and all of a sudden being one of the senior most, and then for a while, the senior most officer who happened to be trans in the United States military, there's a lot of responsibility there. But it's about using it to enable others to succeed and to go further. And the book was just one tool in that, in that we tell the stories of people to normalize the trans experience, to understand that it's just you know one group of people and being trans is like number seven or eight on their list of identities. They join to serve for all the same reasons uh, as anyone else. And they are doing these amazing things all around the world. And if we can show and highlight those stories to make it better for everyone that follows, awesome. And it, it so is a huge accomplishment, but it's more 
a means to other ends in terms of making it better. And one of those we just achieved uh, in the Department of the Air Force just this past month, we changed the policy and explicitly authorized people to use pronouns in their signature blocks, including they, them pronouns, which is awesome and a first. And for the department to jump ahead and be the first to do this was incredible because what a simple act of inclusion right. to tell everyone that they belong. Uh, and it's for the women who are constantly called sir. Uh, it's for the non-binary folks that didn't have another way of representing itself. It wasn't just about me or the trans folks or anyone else. It was about making it better and setting that culture that allows everyone to reach their full potential. So a uh, book is awesome. I would be love to talk with any of you about it later on, uh, but it's a means to an end to enable people to go further. Absolutely, fantastic stories. So many examples of leadership. Um, each of you being your authentic selves and leading and serving others. Uh, so Brie, a follow-up question for you from the audience. Uh, the question is, is, would you share more or talk about your experience of being in the Air Force during the don't ask, don't tell period? Mm -hmm. So. Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, was a, a law that was in place that banned uh, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals from basically identifying as such. It said, you, you can be, that's fine, but don't tell anyone about it, and we're going to try not to ask about it, except people did ask, and there were uh, all sorts of still hunts for people, uh, thousands of discharges, and it, it really spoke for LGB individuals uh, about some of the things we've talked about, that they had to subsume their identity and be less than who they could be in order to put some priorities first that they wanted to serve and they wanted to be a part of something. Uh, and the detrimental effect was more than just on those individuals. It was on the performance of units and organizations that didn't have them. So when that was repealed in 2011, uh, just over 10, 10 years ago, you know, there's this amazing sense of pride and accomplishment that people can be themselves. Um, and for me in particular, um, that was great. It was wonderful. I celebrated along with everyone else, uh, but also still had to say, well, what about me? And what about all these other people who still have to live in the closet? And we thought it was going to be at least another 10, 20 years till we saw open trans service as well to enable another group to serve. Uh, and you know, through some, some courage of some incredible people, some allies, we made that happen in just five years, uh, in, in 2016 for the first time. Uh, but then unfortunately in, in 2017, I had my commander in chief tweet that I and, and everyone like me was a burden on the military and should not be allowed in any way, shape or form to serve. Um, and again, we're gonna speak to the resilience of people to get through that because they took care of themselves in other ways. They had other things that were more important to them. Uh, they took uh, energy from their families, from their friends, from the things they cared about, from their teammates serving around them who said, yeah, you are valued. You're an important member of this team. And they made it through uh, to this year now being allowed to serve openly and authentically again. Uh, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, it truly has. Uh, but again, I, I throw it to my uh, several thousand transgender colleagues within the United States military uh, who did amazing things, were incredibly resilient, and came through it with flying colors by showing just how valuable they were every day uh, to their mission here at home and all around the world. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Bree. Uh, following up, for, uh, this is a question from the audience for all of our panelists um, or whoever, whomever would like to answer it. Um, talking about different identities in terms of being a mother, a parent, a spouse, a partner, uh, how do you balance some of the work and family life? Um, one of the specific aspects that was asked is also um, how do you consider or add education to that if you're working full time with or without a family and maybe your job is offering to pay for additional education? Um, what are some of your thoughts around this topic? So I have, um, I went back to school and got my MBA when I had, my daughter was maybe um, six years old, right? 
Um, and I thought about it, and I, you know, am I taking time away from her? But I'm also setting an example for her, right? Um, I was able to go to do um, study abroad in Italy and China, um, and I brought her along with me. So, um, one, you know, one, one, as a parent, um, I knew that's my primary job, right? Because you don't get to. Do, you don't get do-overs as a parent, right? So for me, once I became a parent, being a parent was my number one job. Um, and then, you know, work, I needed to keep food on the table. <laughs> but um, being a parent is always the number one job because I don't, there's no do-overs in a child's life. So that was primary important to me. Yeah, I'll offer the same thing um, and it's, it's interesting, I talked briefly earlier about, you know, there are times when you are, are all in and uh, on one aspect or another of your life and, and we certainly have those moments uh, in the military um, and, and we're expected to be, for the most part, uh, all in at, at all times. Uh, but recently I was offered to interview for um, a, a really important position, uh, would have been an, an amazing opportunity uh, and less than a week later as they're still considering I had to send one of the hardest emails of my life. We'd had some issues with, with one of my kids uh, that was gonna require some more attention over, over the next year, uh, and it was gonna be really difficult. And I had to send that email asking to, you know, take, take my name out of consideration for this position. And for someone who had been all in up to this point, had gone through the interview like, absolutely, I will be there, I will do all these things, uh, it's gonna be amazing, to have to then say, I have to put my family first right now, and I would be doing both you and me a disservice if I were to stay in the running for this position and if I were to be selected and something more were to happen, and then I had to say, no, I, I have to go home, I have to do this, I have to take care of my family, in a time where I'm actually in a job that has some flexibility with telework uh, and the ability to do things with my family, but still, how hard it was to be like, I, I, I can't. I, I want to, I really want to, but I can't. And so it's, it's about priorities and what do you put first? And that's gonna change at different points in your life, what comes first and, and what comes second. But think about those things and, and what truly matters to you and make sure you're embracing and taking care of those things that truly matter. I think the, it, maybe going back to the, the sustainability theme that we're talking about here, I couldn't agree with Bree more that um, you know, finding the, finding the long-term balance among all these diverse areas of your life. Sometimes you are 24-7 heads down in your career. Sometimes you're 24-7 heads down in a family member or um, a friend or your health or your mental, whatever it might be. Um, and, and that's how it is. I, I, I can't think of a time ever that all of those things were perfectly balanced, like this gets a third, this gets a third, this gets a third. Um, it, does, it doesn't work that way, and so it's, it's being able to deal with kind of that ebb and flow and, and adjust to it and making sure that over a longer term there's that balance that you need to be successful and, and healthy. Um, I think uh, the Probably the, the, the other part of this, uh, to touch on a comment I made earlier about empathy, is if you want, if you want the, the whole to succeed, your, your team to succeed, um, to, to pave a good path for folks like you who might be struggling with similar, um, similar challenges, um, empathy is so important in this regard to understand that my colleague has um, a challenge going on at home or that so-and-so is in a degree program at night and doesn't have time to that the time to stay at work until 8 o'clock on a special project or something. Understanding where um, what your teammates are bringing to the table and having empathy for that and being really willing to work with them and support them has been so important. I've been on the receiving end of that certainly in my, in my career and um, I try to be thoughtful about doling it out to when I when I see folks bringing that to the table, excellent, excellent empathy. Can I add just one one little bit more because that's such an important point for those of you that are leaders, will be leaders, managers, supervisors, whatever the case is. Not just the understanding what your folks are going through, but also the if you can offer that flexibility, even if you're doing something really important and you know, oh, well, if I let them do this or work from home or do that, and their productivity might go down just a little bit. 
think long term. How much more dedicated is that person going to be both to you, to the organization, if they know you have their back and you've given them that support and they, in a week or two weeks or whatever it takes, can come back stronger and more dedicated and more impressed with you know, your company, your organization, and like, oh my God, I'm so passionate. This organization is so wonderful in my time of need. They treated me like a human and realized that life happens. So uh, just think about that when you're in those positions to influence others' lives. Yes, lots of good advice and wisdom uh, has already been mentioned. Uh, another question from the audience is, what are some of the differences women bring to aerospace, and how can aerospace overall benefit from those differences? And I'll open the floor, Who are, whichever of our panelists would like to speak. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start. I, um, I think I've had, I've had the benefit over the past 20 plus years of my career, um, you know, starting my career in a, in a heavily, heavily male dominated in environment. Um, NASA in the early 90s um, uh, and late 90s uh, and, uh, you know, in, in uh, Texas and kind of this, this mentality that was very, very dominated by um, what are traditionally seen as male stereotypes and male attributes. Um, and I very much uh, adjusted myself to that because that was how you succeed. Um, you take on these behaviors, you take on these, these qualities and kind of mirror some of those things to succeed. And, um, you know, inter interesting to think about authenticity and, and how that, um, how you get these realizations, I think, during your your career, and fast forward to now at, at Blue Origin, and um, being able to interact with um, our, our business resource groups that are really prioritizing diversity um, topics and helping to educate um, our our colleagues on um, things like bias and gender differences in the workplace and. The, the positive things that a diverse work environment um, um, really reflects and, and being able to look at um, really data-driven studies that, that show this. And, and I do think that what I've seen um, is that women are very, very strong at multitasking, at, at juggling, and, and perhaps it's for, you know, for, to our last question, it's family, it's education, it's career, um, it's, it's worrying about any number of those things and, and really working hard to keep all of them successful, keep all the balls in the air, um, keep all of them healthy. And I've, I've found that I have some really phenomenal um, female colleagues who just absolutely excel at keeping 10 balls in the air um, at the, at the uh, same time. So that, that was the first thing that came to mind when, when you asked that. So I'll add, I, and, and this may be stereotypical, um, and because there are, there are men that exhibit this quality too, uh, but one leadership trait I think we really undervalue, and especially in the military we, we undervalue this, is the leadership quality of vulnerability and the ability to share some of yourself that makes you human. And when you share those things, those vulnerabilities that make you human, it helps people realize you're someone that has problems, challenges, differences too, and they can connect with you. They want to tell you things. They want to bring things to your attention. And when you're in a leadership role, having your people unafraid of you in that area where they can say, hey, I've got a problem and I feel okay sharing this with you. Uh, that's something that we miss out on, and I think women really tend to bring that more often than others. Uh, but I do want to also, you know, expand this a little bit and, and say, you know, all intersectional identities, all minority identities, you bring that different set of perspectives, experiences, backgrounds, ways of thinking that we need, because if we have a unicultural uh, experience that is only thinking one way, you get those it's the way we've always done it. Uh, you don't have those people challenging things for different reasons or seeing it from a different angle. Uh, and that is so vitally important today in environments that are constantly shifting, shifting fast. 
Uh, we need those different perspectives and that openness, that vulnerability from a, someone in a leadership role to accept those perspectives. And, and I think that's something that we really can bring to the table. I think also, um, and you know, everyone is different and I think it's very important to look at individuals for what they are and who they are. Um, I think for me, I see that women don't have the egos that men do. <laughs> um, you know, I've been in meetings where, you know, people were just beating their chest. I'm number one. No, I'm number one. And I'm just like, are you serious? <laughs> We have a mission to accomplish and we're going to sit and try and figure out who's number one, you know, so um, I think, you know, being able to kind of leave your ego at the door and um, look at the bigger picture is a trait that I think, you know, a lot of women possess that is an attribute. Um, because if you get into those kind of competitions, you're not going to, you're going to miss the comp, you're going to miss the end objective. Absolutely. Uh, as we are coming to the end of our time here, um, I'd like to offer each of you some either closing comments, some wisdom, or some advice that you'd like to leave our audience with today. Um, well, I, I'll start. I learned so much when I um, do things like this, and this is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting Claudine and Bree, and um, I, I'm struck by so many of, um, of your comments, and I think my takeaway from the, if you all thought that you were the only ones learning something here today. No. <laughs> um, what, I, um, what I take away from this is, is the idea of, um, you know, leaving, leaving this industry and my career and my company better than where I found it, to your point earlier, um, and, and um, the, the purpose of some of my actions being um, to make things better or easier or what, you know, in, insert positive word here for um, folks who are similarly situated to me or to others that I, I am able to recognize who might be marginalized in some way. Um, so I think uh, really great comments on that from both of you and I, I appreciate <laughs> the ability to learn from you here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ditto for me. Um, I this is very empowering, and it's also empowering to just see the difference that within AIAA from the last conference that I attended. I see more diversity at these conferences, and I'm encouraged, um, but encouraged with haste. Right? I don't want to wait another 20 years to see like parity. Right? So we have, I'm um, gonna estimate 200 people in this room, right? So imagine if you, each of you are able to influence another 200 underrepresented people or, you know, just 200 other aerospace engineers, right? Um, we can quickly change this industry to be one that is, supports all inclusion of all people. And when we have that inclusion of all people, we can excel in, accomplish so much more. So please take, my hope is that you take something back with you where you go um, and uh, are inspired to change the, gener the next generation of aerospace professionals. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, hard to follow up on that because there's just so much I want to echo and, and Claudine and Audrey have you know, enlightened me on a lot of things today. Uh, but the, the two things I'll, I'll add to wrap up on are, you know, look around your organization, your school, wh whatever that may be, and not many of us have the ability to change the diversity, the makeup of that organization. So diversity for most of us is just a fact, but all of us can change the inclusiveness of our organizations because inclusiveness is an act, and you can be deliberately inclusive in the things that you do to bring others in. So if you ever get you know, told that you are a trailblazer, that is something I think you should all try and seize. Not because it means that you did something first or you've done something amazing, but think about the definition of that term and what it means. By being a trailblazer, you have built a path behind you. You have 
paved this, the street, you have cut down the trees, whatever it is that makes it easier for the people that are following you to get to where you got to and still have the energy left to go further. Mm -hmm. So that is something I hope you can all seize and do something that enables people to go further after you. Wonderful. This is fantastic advice. I have learned so much. Um, I think it's a wonderful ask uh, to leave things better than we found them, uh, to intentionally be inclusive, and to go out and influence those around us. Uh, I will say as we wrap up, um, I will invite the people who are here in person, please join us right after this for networking. We were not able to get to all of the questions, so our speakers will be available for follow-up. Uh, and again, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to spend this time on stage with you. Brie, Claudine, Audrey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.